How did Osho come into your life and what happened next? It's, it's, it's not very different, I think, from many other people in the sense that back in the uh, 60s, we were, you know, a large number of young people in England were may, looking for something spiritual. I don't, I don't think they would even use the word spiritual, but, um, you know, there was uh, a lot of marijuana, a lot of hashish, uh, LSD. And then, of course, the Beatles, I think, were quite instrumental in um, turning people on. And also, of course, they uh, connected with the Maharashi Mahesh Yogi, um, who was known in England as the giggling guru. And so there was a widespread search and people were looking for Sufi stories, uh, yoga. And then there were already, uh, there was the first first festival at Glastonbury, which has now become a huge thing. And then I think uh, there were a couple of gurus at that. Um, I, I was not very enthusiastic about looking for a guru. I didn't want, um, if it felt a little bit humiliating to have a guru. <laughs> to surrender. Um, yeah. And, uh, but then I, some friends of mine came back from India uh, in the orange clothes and uh, with the mala, you know, the, the wooden beads. And they brought with them a, a certain kind of energy, like they were glowing. Uh, I know that sounds strange. And it, in fact, it was strange. <laughs> um, <laughs> But they they were radiating a certain energy uh, and uh, coming from Pune, of course, and it became clear to me very quickly that I that um, there was something special there that I was that I was not finding in London. Um, and so I went to I caught a Qantas uh, flight to M London, Mumbai, and uh, went to Pune and uh, came to the ashram in uh, March 1976, early March 1976. Wow. That was right at the beginning of Pune, yeah. yeah? It was not exactly at the beginning. Pune began in March 1974. That, that was when Osho left Bombay. He left his apartment in Woodlands and uh, traveled to Pune. And uh, there was a... Um, a Greek, a wealthy Greek woman called Mukta, she bought the house, the first house where he stayed. And then the ashrams sort of grew, grew around him as more properties were acquired. It, it, when I went there, uh, in the beginning, there were just two properties back to back, which are now Krishna House and Blatsu House. So it was very small in some way, and yet it seemed huge in, a, in another way. You know, it seemed... Like, I mean, there's, I'm, I've, I've said this before, but there's, a, there's an English uh, BBC television sci science fiction program called Doctor Who. I don't know if you've heard about it. Well, yes. he, you know, he travels around in a small police box, but when you go inside the box, it's enormous. So Puna was like that. Mm -hmm. it, was a, it was a world unto itself. I think there was a certain relief um, in me when I, I very soon realized that Osho had what I, you know, the, was an enlightened being and that um, that's what I was looking for, really. So uh, it made sense to stay there. <laughs> <laughs> How was your first meeting with him? Yes. Yeah, I um just to let you know, I I describe all this in my new version of my book, um, India's Misfit Mystic. It just start it starts with that first meeting. Um Lao Tzu was um was surrounded by trees and bushes, and it it um it felt very magical somehow. 
you know, when we when we walked down the side of the house and around the corner, and they had arranged, um, they had turned the car, the car porch into a marble platform, and we he was sitting on the marble platform, and we sat around him. Um, I think you know, it's very difficult to put into words, but basically meeting a man who is at home in himself, who is. Um, at one with his being, you know, we, I think a lot of people can relate to the fact that, yes, yeah, sometimes we're in the head, sometimes we're in the heart, sometimes we're in the body. But I think that was the first time I met a man who was at home in his being, you know, he was, I think that it sounds like a cliche, but he was, he was at home, you know, we we can be at home sometimes, but more often than not, we're out of the house. <laughs> 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 yeah. So um, then I took sannyas. I mean, it, it, that whole hesitation that I had before of not wanting to be with a, a guru or a teacher, it somehow became irrelevant. I wanted to experience what he had to offer. And it was quite apparent to me and to everybody else that if you wanted to experience what he had to offer, you had to be initiated as a sannyasin. Uh, it was a way of saying, okay, let's see what you, you know, what, what have you got, you know? <laughs> uh, and what's the and, meaning of uh, your name? Oh, uh, he, the name is Swami Anand Sabuti. Swami, all, all the guys who came to Osho were called Swami. And all the women were called Ma. Um, then Anand means bliss, and Subhuti, he said, was the name of one of Buddha's disciples, Gautam Buddha's disciples, who just who I think actually Subhuti was the first one to become an enlightened being under Buddha, because he understood what Osho described as the potency of emptiness. He learned how to dissolve himself into nothingness. You know, Buddha talks a lot about wow. nothingness and emptiness. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, so I got a rough idea of what uh, mm -hmm. you know what what the program was. And how was the darshan and, and the the, the sanyas for you? Yeah, I I don't know that it's easy for me to describe because on on the one one hand, uh, you know, there was a connection with a space, I, I, particularly when he said, close your eyes and listen to the bird. There was a connection to a space uh, which seemed to be, um, there, there was nothing of me, there was nothing of him, there was just this kind of um, empty space. Uh, but uh, these things are very difficult to describe, you know. There, were, there was certainly a quantum leap in 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 experience for me because I'd met a few teachers, a few spiritual teachers, and uh, nice people, you know, and and some of them also had a certain energy. But um, he was like, um, you know, in a in a in a separate league, you know, an immediate understanding that I needed to be around this guy and absorb what he has to, sh to share. I'm, I'm not sounding very uh, devoted. Um, <laughs> because some people say, oh, you know, it, uh, it was a wonderful, it was, uh, I, you know, uh, I felt his love or, yes. but, but it wasn't like that for me. Mm -hmm. It was more, mm -hmm. it was like, oh yeah, it was like, you know, good. I found somebody who's got what I, I'm looking for. So there was a kind of relief in in it, and a and a gratitude that I had actually found what I you know, found what I was looking for. In the sense of finding finding someone who was fully awakened. But then, of course, the whole journey starts of transforming myself. You know, one journey the quest the quest to find an enlightened being ended, and the quest for enlightenment began. That's a nice way to say it. So tell us a bit 
through the different phases of Osho's work, how was it for you? Puna 1, Rajnish Puram, Puna 2, World Tour. In some ways, I think Puna 1, which was 1976 to 1981, I was there for most of that period. I did go back after six months of being with him for one year to, to, to my old job in the House of Parliament in the UK. But then I came back and then I stayed. So I stayed from, I think, um, September or October 1977. I was there the whole time until he left for, for Oregon. In a way, I found that to be the most potent phase. I, I don't know whether it was something to do with just being a beginner, but every, everything seemed magical. The ashram was like a pulsating ball of energy. And it was called an ashram in those days. It was the Sri Rajneesh ashram. And the morning discourses, his morning discourses were like, uh, you know, co a constant invitation to go in, uh, to, to explore oneself. And of course, you know, I did the therapy groups initially. And then I started working in his, in his press office which then became my main work in Pune One. So it was a very um, intense little little pressure cooker, Pune, Pune One. In that sense, I suppose it has a special, a special place in my memory. It seemed more magical somehow. When we went to Oregon, which was uh, summer of uh, 81, I was at, I first went to the, uh, Kipps Castle, which was in New Jersey. And he was there at that moment. And then I was sent on to Oregon to help get the place ready. And he followed, I think, in a few days, maybe in a week, that they, ha they had his um, bungalow ready for him. One week or two weeks, I'm not sure how long it was before he came. Um, but it wasn't long. And yeah, I was there then. Um, I never left. I stayed there for the whole of the Oregon experience until uh, after he left. He he was deported in November 1985, and I stayed until early 1986. And then I uh, went down to California. But um, so yeah, I was there for the whole of the ranch. It was an interesting mix because on the one hand, it, there was still this energy and, uh, you know, we were, we, the, the media started calling us Rajneeshis, which seemed really ridiculous to me because we all thought of ourselves as sannyasins. And then we built the ranch and, uh, and it, was a, it was a strange mix of East and West. I think that's why I, look, I don't look back on it with such pleasure as Pune One because Pune One was Eastern mysticism, Eastern mysticism with the volume turned up, you know, to the max. And the ranch was Eastern mysticism somehow <laughs> trying to find a place in central Oregon, you know, and with bulldozers and trucks and uh, cowboy boots. So it was, it didn't really have that, right? it, it was, it was more like Gurdjieff, you know, Gurdjieff, uh, we, we, you know, he always used to talk about the work with his disciples. So, you know, Rajnish Puram was the work, I think. Maybe Pune One was the honeymoon and Rajnish Puram was the work. <laughs> yeah, and then, of course, uh, the intensity of the ranch started to increase, you know, uh, as the opposition grew and, uh, you know, the the whole thing came to a to an end very very dramatically. It was a very dramatic end. Uh, not only with Sheila um, leaving and blaming Osho for uh, being too interested in Rolls Royces, but uh, you know the whole of the U.S. government uh, wanting to get rid of us. Then uh, I mean, very, you know, we can go back over this if you have questions about it. But then. When I finally left the ranch, I mean, towards the end of the ranch, I just wanted to get out, but then everybody left. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I, I stayed 
um, until the spring, I think, of 86. And then I went down to California and started living in Mill, in Mill Valley, uh, just north of San Francisco in the Bay Area. And I stayed there for almost two years. And during that time, Osho went on, went on his world tour. He was, you know, so nobody wanted him. He came back to Bombay, Mumbai, and uh, stayed in a disciple's house there for six months, I think. And finally came came back to Pune in uh, 1987, right, January 87, I think. And I, I went back in, um, I think, October 87. So he'd been back in Pune for a while um, by the time I caught up with him. And, uh, and then more or less stayed there until he died in 1990. Puna 2 was different in a way. It wasn't quite so ma magical as Puna 1. I mean, I think the, the possibilities for transformation were the same, that the energy was there, but it didn't quite have the same intensity in some ways. I can't really explain it. And then I stayed on. When Osho left, I when he left his body in January 1990, I stayed... I stayed on in Pune for most of the 90s. I mean, I went back, you know, there were trips back to England, trips back to California to make money, to do this and that, or to Thailand to get a new visa when we had to. And, uh, but I was pretty much based in Pune through the 90s. And then also after the millennium. And it was only like probably the last 10 years that I've been uh, more relocated back in the West. So uh, that's in in a few minutes. That's the story of my yeah. life with Osho. Yeah, we want to hear also about this experience of the Rajneet Theater Group. Oh yeah, um, that was Pune one, and I think it was like in seventy eight or seventy nine. Osho's discourses were in the morning. And in the evening, he gave darshan. But if you weren't going to darshan, you could either go to music group or hang out with your friends. Um, a group of English sannyasins, who had, who, many of whom had had experience of theater, uh, started reading just for fun. They started reading um, A Midsummer Night's Dream, which is one of um, William Shakespeare's most uh, enjoyable comedies, romantic comedy. And it suddenly occurred to me that we had this um, very controversial reputation in India as, you know, he was the sex guru, we were the free love ashram, you know, it was a very, um, very sensational uh, reputation. And I, I thought, well, if we take this play around India, it will counterba counterbalance the free love ashram uh, reputation. In a way, there's nothing more respectable than William Shakespeare. So I wrote to Osho saying, why don't we take this play on the road? And he said, yeah, go, yeah, go ahead. So we, that's when the Rajneesh Theatre Group was formed. I doubled up. I was sometimes in the Rajneesh Theatre Group, sometimes in the press office. And I, I had a role in, um, in Midsummer Night's Dream. I played the ang an angry, jealous father of one of the one of the lovers in the play, and uh, so we went to uh, we we did it in Pune, we did it in Mumbai, we did it in Delhi, um, Surat, and Ahmedabad, I think. So we took it around, and there was one more play which was done, which was I think as Twelfth Night, um, but I was not in that one. So it was really um, I think. One of the things it showed, I think it also helped people to understand, if they did, that Osho's vision of sannyas was creative. It wasn't about just sitting down, chanting mantras or smoking chillums. It was, um, it, were, it had a creativity to it. Um, one of the nice things about the theater group was that all of the costumes were done in sannyas colors. So there were a lot of oranges and reds and, and pinks. 
Um, and that, that was all designed by Madeva Padma and her boyfriend, I think, Sudena Murray Clark. And Padma went on to design the Turodex, the Zen Turo, which is very popular around the world. And then she had two more decks after that, uh, the Tao deck and the Sacred Chi deck. So she did the costumes and I think Sedena did the sets. So I think it was a pretty success. It was a pretty successful project. And another question. It said that you met Ronald Reagan at the White House. He was against social. And how was this experience for you? Yeah, it was a bit strange, really. I mean, we met quite a few people. We met Mrs. Gandhi in India. She um, she came to see, the, she didn't come to the performance, but she she invited the Rajneesh Theatre Group to her, to the Prime Minister's bungalow in New Delhi. And we had, I don't know, a 15, 20 minute chat with her. She was a lovely woman, very, I think she had a certain grace. Um, anyway, that, that was Mrs. Gandhi. And then it was um, odd, the uh, meeting with Ronald Reagan, because I married a, a young woman called Shannon Ryan, who was the daughter of Congressman Leo Ryan, who was killed in Jonestown. He was, he was a congressman for, for, for South San Francisco, though, um, a very liberal Democrat. And uh, many of his constituents started writing to him saying, we're, we're, we think there's something uh, not quite right happening down in Guyana where Jim Jones had taken, Jim Jones had the people, organized the People's Temple and that was based in the San Francisco area, but then at a certain point where he felt persecuted, he took the entire People's Temple down to Guyana because the lead, the, the president of Guyana was a friend of his. So they built the People's Temple in Guyana. And then uh, Congressman Ryan got these letters from constituents saying, we think our, our relatives are being held against their will in Jonestown. So he flew down to, to take a look and see what was going on. And he made a mistake. He didn't ask for police protection. And uh, he went to Jonestown and he was killed by, the, by Jim Jones' lieutenants. Now, he actually turns out to be the only congressman assassinated in the line of duty ever in the history of um, history of American politics. So his daughter, one of his daughters, Pat Ryan, campaigned in Washington for her father to be awarded the Congressional Gold Medal of Honor because he died in the line of duty uh, out of concern for his constituents. And because he was dead, even if he was a Democrat, the Republicans had no problem signing. And you need to get, I think, two thirds of the signatures of the Senate and the House of Representatives. So she got it. Everybody signed and she got the gold medal and the gold medal is presented by the incumbent president who happened to be Ronald Reagan. So after I married Shannon, we both went to Washington for the ceremony um, with the Ryan family. So we all got to shake his hands and we all, we wore our red uh, clothes. That's the, the question. Yeah. With Mala? With the Mala, with the Mala and the thing. And, and Ronald, Reagan, Ronald Reagan was standing at the door of the Oval Office. And so as we came, as we came up to him, we, we gave him a namaste, and let him see our Malas, and then we shook his hand and we went inside. And not much happened. I mean, I didn't talk to the guy. Um, I'm not sure that... I didn't really want to upset the family. You know, it was their ceremony and I felt that um you know I I and of course he was surrounded by um bodyguards you know it was um very the security was pretty tight uh anyway we um we had our photo taken with him and uh you know then we went back to back to the ranch mm. what year was it he the the, the government was already Prosecuting Russia? Yeah, I think the government was already moving 
against Osho, but not in a very obvious way. I think Reagan and the White House were talking to the Justice Department and saying, what are you doing? What are you doing about this guy? You know, there was an immediate understanding that they wanted to get rid of him. You know, um, and then it was a question of how. Because, you know, he was collecting Rolls Royces, he was talking that, you know, he was you know, making comments. And of course, he was in silence at one point. But when he started talking again, he did say, you know, America is a hypocrisy, not a democracy. And Ronald Reagan is a third rate cowboy actor. And, oh, you know, the usual provocative stuff. It was pretty clear they wanted to get rid of him. And uh, the pressure came down to the US attorney for Oregon, Charles Turner. Um, because that's where they saw, you know, they said, look, you've got to do something about this. And there was pressure from the White House, there was pressure from the Justice Department, there was pressure from local people. So that's how they basically, they looked at all their options and they decided in the end that the, uh, the best way to do it was to charge him with immigration fraud. And that's what they did. Yes, in Lakshin's movie, uh, 10,000 Shades of Osho, which you yeah. appear, yeah, uh, some parts of it, it's mentioned that there was a recognition that to go to America was a mistake. How do you see it? Yeah, I don't, to call it a mistake, I mean, I think Osho was always aware that the safest place for him to be was India, because India, the Indian government could not throw him out of India because he was Indian. And he, he answered a question of mine. Um, he said, uh, you know, the Indian government can create problems for you, but we can, you know, that we can manage very easily, but they they can't get rid of me. They can't send me out of the country. So this is the best situation for me. The problem was he wanted um, a commune where everybody could be inside, you know, inside the walls, like a pressure cooker. Um, and that was not possible in Pune because um, the ashram couldn't hold any more people. You know, people were living outside in houses, in bamboo huts down by the river. They were live. There was another section up in uh, Saswad, which was about um, I don't know, ten miles away. Uh, so it, it was scattered. And although Lakshmi, his secretary, was trying to find land in the Himalayas, and there was some possibility, but it was going very slowly. And Sheila, at that point, said, "Look, come to America, and I we can buy land, and nobody can stop us." And also it will take care of your health problems because at that time he was suffering from a bad back and a few other things and asthma. And, and it certainly improved his health immediately. Um, the Northern, you know, North American temperate climate and, uh, you know, lack of pollution. It was, um, it was very beneficial to his health. That was obvious. And then we then we started. Then the the land was purchased in Oregon, and we started building the commune there. I don't know. You th the thing is this: if you call it a mistake, you suppose you presuppose that you know what Osho's intentions were. And as far as I can see, his only intention was that he wanted people around him to work on them. And it was never, I don't think, you know, that Oregon was ever meant to be the paradise on earth that people seem to think it might become. Uh, because he was too outrageous. You know, if you, if you want to create a stable, safe, permanent community, you know, you don't start talking and call your discourses the Rajneesh Bible. You know, you don't, um, ins you don't insult America. You don't. Um, you know, you don't collect 93 Rolls Royces and, you know, basically put the finger up to uh, American materialism. And you don't take over the county, you know, you don't take over Antelope, you don't, 
you don't, you don't upset people and we were upsetting people all the time. So I don't think, I mean, Osho was always in a way uh, increasing the pressure and he didn't, I don't think he wanted to stay in America. He, he even, even in 1984, a year before he left, he sent Sheila and some of the other people back to India to see if they can find, because some, I think somebody had offered some land and he wanted them to go and check it out. So he was not invested in the experiment. I don't think you can call it a mistake. I mean, it was certainly dramatic and the Oregon commune fell apart, obviously when he left. But it's beyond it's beyond me to call it a mistake. It was what it was, you know. Um, I don't think with Osho we were ever meant to settle down and play play happy families ever after. You know what I mean? It was always going to be a it was always going to be a roller coaster ride. It was always going to be chaotic, explosive, um, intense pressure. So. I think that you know, there's this, you know, the jury's still out. I don't think you can come to a conclusion. Maybe you know, when I'm a, when I when when the day comes and I'm an enlightened being, I'll look back and see that it was the, the greatest success that ever happened. You know what I mean? We don't we don't know, you know. So I wouldn't say it was a mistake. I would just say it was a hell of a ride. <laughs> But I mean, I am curious what would have happened. Like, I think if he'd really been able to have his way, if he'd been able to do what he really wanted, he wanted a commune in Kashmir. You know, he wanted a, a community in the Himalayas, preferably in Kashmir. But um, in a way, we were lucky we didn't find a place in Kashmir because it then became a very dangerous place to be in the 90s and, and beyond. So we'll, ne we'll never know what might have happened if he'd been able to establish a community in the Himalayas, what that would have looked like. He didn't want to come back to Pune after Oregon. He did not want, he wanted, he tried sending people here and there to look for, in the end he had to come back to Pune because there was nowhere else to go. Yes. Uh... What else? We interviewed uh, Nilam's daughter, Priya, and Please. she told us that Osho wanted to go to the Himalayas. With yeah. a small community with, with not so much people when he wants something smaller. At no, the it's not actually, it's not, that's really not the case. I mean, and back in back in um, in Pune one, we were we were all going to go to Gujarat at one point. There was there's going to be we were all going to shift to a commune in Gujarat. And I know at one point uh, at the end of the round, she said, "I want to go to the Himalayas with with just twelve people and work with them." Uh, and I was one of them. Wow. I was on the list apparently. So mm. God, God knows what he would have done. <laughs> How he was going to work on us. I think I was lucky that it never happened. <laughs> but I, he didn't really, I don't think he really wanted to do that. He wanted to work on as many people as possible. So the idea of being in the Himalayas, uh, yes, he had this idea of working with 12 people. But, um, and he could have done that, but, but he didn't in the end, because I think what he really wanted was a big community living together in the Himalayas, just like, you know, a transplant of Oregon, you know, but it never happened, of course. So you wrote books about Osho. Could you share with us about that too? Hey. <laughs> this That's is the big. story. I've had, um, uh, it started off as a very thin book, which I was in a hurry to publish, but that that, that much, um, called My Dance with the Madman. That was the first edition. And then um, uh, when Wild Wild Country, when the Netflix series Wild Wild Country came out, I uh, got a publishing deal in London 
uh, with the publisher and it came out much thicker. We wrote many more stories and that was called Wild Wild Guru. Um, and then just uh, recently I got a, a, a publishing contract in India and this one is just coming out right now, actually. And it's, it's basically the same. Uh, of course, I've only, I've only had one life with Osho, so it's bound to be the same story, more or less. Uh, I added a few, a, a few stories. And this one's called India's Misfit Mystic. Because actually, he always described himself as an unfit, but what he meant was misfit. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the... That's the latest. Wow. How how we get this book? Amazon? Yeah, I mean, at the moment, um, I don't think it's available internationally. I think it's only available in India at the moment. But we will, you know, within, uh, hopefully within a few weeks, we will have, um, and we'll, we'll have it available internationally. That's beautiful. You, you have some other books on Osho? No, I have one book of um, like uh, short stories about Pune called The Pune Diaries and short stories about um, Tiruvannamalai down in South India where the Ramana Maharishi had his ashram um, and a couple of novels I've written about India, being, you know, um, fantasy novels, romantic yeah. novels. So, um, yeah, I've written quite a lot, but the only book, to be honest, the only book worth reading. <laughs> well, the others are <laughs> worth reading, but the only, the real thing is this. This, wow. is the real, this, is a story, this is a story of my life with Osho. That's... So, we long to get it, so we yeah. wait for your time. You, you're going to yeah. tell on Facebook, yeah, when it's available, yeah? Yeah, I, I've just put a post up today about the book signing in Mumbai. Yeah, yes. as soon as it's available internationally, I'll let you know. Yes, great, great. How was it for you when Osho left his body, Subuti? Well, I mean, I think, you know, it's, it's just going to sound a bit strange, but I always wanted to live longer than Osho because his impact on my life was so powerful that it, in a way it, it was overwhelming. So I hadn't, I didn't know, I was kind of curious what my life would be without him. So there was that side to it. But I remember also feeling very, uh, on the night that we, we burned his body, I was down at the burning gats. And in the morning, I woke up feeling very sad that he had left his body. But then when I went into the ashram, it was, um, the energy was still the same. Uh, his energy, if you like, was still there. It didn't change anything in a sense. And you need to kind of remember that the, the previous year, he had been sick for long periods, so we didn't actually see him so much. So we got used to feeling his presence. So in a way, um, it felt like he, he hadn't left. So that changed my uh, gestalt to some extent. I always thought I would leave when uh, Lee, I would leave Pune when, when Osho died, but I, it was quite obvious to me that I wanted to stay there, simply because the energy field continued. Then, of course, through the 90s, gradually the commune dis dissolved because pe for many reasons, people went to other spiritual teachers. They felt they needed somebody who was still in the body. Um, people were getting older, so they wanted to get good jobs in the West and maybe only come back for a few weeks in the winter. So gradually, the commune, very gradually, it, would not, it didn't fall apart. It, it, it kind of dissolved 
and and turned into this resort whereby many of the ordinary jobs like cleaning or, and cooking uh, became taken over by um, uh, Sudexo, the service, the service company. And that was inevitable in a way because, you know, as we got older and, uh, you know, people coming back from the West and they only had like four weeks, they didn't want to work, you know, they didn't want to work. You know, they wanted to enjoy themselves. I, in a way, it was an inevitable transition from a commune to a resort. How it went up to the millennium and beyond. During that time, I gradually was spending more and more time in the West and less time in Pune. That was after the millennium. So now in a way, I'm more based in the UK, living, spending more time in the UK than I do in India. But India is always going to be my spiritual home. You know, that's just the way it is. It, it's, uh, they, they ought to have spiritual passports too, so we could have India. <laughs> because India is not just a country. It's a, it's, a, it's a, as Osho used to say, it's not just a country, it's a, a state of being. Beautiful. Hmm. How do you see Osho's legacy today? What can you say to newcomers? Um, it's fun meeting new newcomers and, uh, you know, um, seeing how they relate to the place, seeing what they, how they connect. I think the legacy is um, a mystery in a way, because I don't actually think it's got much to, to do with Pune. Um, or any of us, it's gonna. Ha it, it will. It will find its own way. Osho once said that he would be contemporary, by which I think he means generally understood, in about two hundred years after his after his death. Yeah, I, I mean, I think he's created some remarkable shifts in people's understanding. Like, I think. Uh, the sexual freedom and uh, the the love of life and the celebration of that that he gave us or encouraged us to have, I think it's 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 much more accepted now that spirituality doesn't have to mean that you deny having fun, you know. Mm -hmm. So I. I think it's uh, it's an ongoing question. Osho's legacy is an ongoing question, and it will be. It will be. I think it's already, in a way, implanted in society somehow in in global understanding, and it will manifest in different ways, unexpected ways. Uh, and uh, and uh, that's going to go on for hundreds of years, I think. I mean, I think I can see in 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 fifty years' time, some student at some university will will write a PhD on why Osho went to Oregon, you know, stuff like that. You know. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we are coming to an end of these talks. We always like to end with one last question that's very short. We want to you to say one word for Osho. What would that be? Well, the easiest thing to say is wordlessness. <laughs> that's very original. <laughs> 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 great. Because, yes, great. <laughs> Subuti, thank you very much. But we I would also say, I think mystery, mystery is also a, a good word, mystery. A mystic, yeah. he's a mystic, and a mystic is a mystery. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Very, very much. Okay. Good. You're welcome. Thank you for inviting me. Yes, mm. yeah, sure. Sure, thank mm -hmm. you.
Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye, Subuti. Thank <laughs> you.